<laughs> well, my friends, we start with kind of a big question today. What do you do when life seems to be about as bad as it can get? In today's reading, the prophet Jeremiah speaks to people who have been devastated. The Babylonians have ransacked Jerusalem, uh, and that was after a a very long siege to begin with. And so uh, most of the people who survived both the siege and the assault uh, have now been taken into exile. That is, they were marched hundreds of miles to a foreign land, uh, forced to leave everything they knew and loved behind, and try to start a whole new life with a culture and a language and a place that they knew nothing about. With their lives turned upside down, they wonder what hope they have. How do they go on living? Well, with a word that I think remains poignant even for you and I today, God speaks to them and God promises his presence and God promises a hopeful future for these hurting people. And while uh, our experience isn't exactly uh, an exile experience like they've had, certainly I think these last almost two years now uh, have given us some of those same kinds of feelings, haven't they? Being isolated from so much that we know and love, our lives being turned upside down. Um, Many of us over these last two years have lost loved ones and uh, the grief process is even trickier when we can't have funerals like we normally have them. And And we can't see people in the hospital and all of those kinds of things. And so we have some sense of relation to this, don't we? Don't we? Well, into their experience, God comes to speak, as I said, some hope. That promise that God's with them and that God does have a future. And, you know, as we've been speaking over these last couple of weeks, our, our theme has been living in tune with God's heart. And we've been trying to uncover what it means to be a people who, uh, who are attuned with what God is up to. To be people who are uh, learning what, what God is calling us to do and be in the world. And we've kind of seen examples of what that is and what that isn't. And most recently, last week, we were with the, prom- the prophet Amos. And if you remember, Amos uh, came to warn the people that uh, God had sort of, let's say, had enough. And... The bottom line of God's righteous anger in this case in Amos was that God's heart is so much for the whole world that um, when God looks and sees what's happening, it breaks God's heart, literally breaks God's heart. And God's uh, speaking to the Israelites last week through the prophet Amos saying, listen, you all, uh, you, you say you believe in me and you show up to worship and you, you, uh, you know, do your religious duty but I don't see you living your faith. I don't see it changing your heart. I don't see you living in tune with what I want you to be doing in the world. And so rather than bringing the world to life, you're taking advantage of every opportunity you have and you're making it more about yourself. And so Amos brings this word of warning that there's this incredible hypocrisy in the people claiming to be worshipers of God and then not living it out in real tangible ways in their life. And what we find from that is that what God wants and hopes from all of us is an open heart, a heart that's after God's heart, a heart that expresses our faith with love. And as we've been saying, this faith is a faith that goes from our head to our hearts to our hands. It's a faith that leads us to action, a movement from self towards community. And so in this passage today in Jeremiah, we again hear God's call towards community. So I want you to be thinking about that and paying attention to it today. And so our theme on this Consecration Sunday is a church in tune with God's heart for the world. How are we as a people, as a faith community, in tune with God's heart? And how are we turned from self towards the community at large? And where is God in that mix? Now Jeremiah speaks, as I said, to a suffering community today. They are disillusioned and they're struggling with their faith. And his word gives them hope for the future with a call to invest in their community, in their everyday lives. And I think there's some important words for us in this as well. So let's begin with this letter from Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah managed to survive the siege and attack on Jerusalem. He was able to hide away and survive it, and he was left behind. And so he writes this letter to all those who have been taken away or in this terrible place. Let's hear what happens. 
Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he's exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that they may have grandchildren. Multiply, don't dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. You hear this call here to get busy living. And to the midst of their pain and their suffering and their grief and all that they're facing, God says, get busy living. Now, notice, so far, God hasn't said, um, I'm going to get you out of there just this, you know, any moment here. I'm going to bring you back. It'll all be good. He doesn't promise. God doesn't promise to fix it. God doesn't promise to make it all good. But God says, there's life to be lived. There's life to be lived. Get busy living. It reminds me of, of that movie, Shawshank Redemption. I love that conversation. Uh, the Morgan Freeman's character says, you either get busy living or you get busy dying. That quote always sticks with me because it's a choice that we have every single day to make. And it's the choice that God puts in front of these people. He says, get busy living. But notice, uh, in particular, the way that he wants them to get busy living. It's not only about celebrating their family and the things that they have. But, he's, but he says, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Now remember, these are their enemies, right? Where they're living is enemy territory. They're living with their enemies. Now those of you that know me well might know that after yesterday, I really relate to this. (laughs) I don't do these jokes very often, but I'm from Nebraska. I'm a Husker fan, and I'm living in a place of exile sometimes. It's really hard. And yet God says, pray for the place that you live. (laughs) Love the people there. So that's what we do. (laughs) Okay. Had to just, yep, there we go. So we're all good now. But honestly, think about what God is saying to them. You're You're in this place with people who conquered you. And I want you to be a blessing to them. I want you to pray for them. Their welfare determines your welfare. And this is a call for them to turn from self towards the community. As you get busy living, look for opportunity to be a blessing to the community. The community's welfare determines your welfare. Right? And this is at the heart of our call as a congregation, isn't it? Right? Our mission is to love God and love our neighbor as we grow disciples. That thrust always is first we are connected with God, but it's always an outward movement to share God's love with the world. And it's the same thing that God was upset with the people through the prophet Amos. God always wants our faith to move us into action that is love oriented towards our neighbor. And of course, remember that the biblical uh, description of a neighbor, as Jesus put it, is not, not merely the person who lives next to you. But it's everyone you come into contact with. And that includes the people that rub you the wrong way and you don't care for so much. And even when they're Badger fans or a Husker fan, you still love them anyway, right? That's what we're called to do. And maybe, they ha- maybe uh, when they vote, they have an R next to their name or a D next to their name or something else. And Jesus calls us to love our neighbor. Our faith lived out in action. So this is the call that Jeremiah brings to these people in exile. Get busy living, and while you are living in the blessings that God gives you, don't forget to bless your community as well. Be a blessing. Well, the passage is going to continue, and here's where for me this passage really sort of can, it can take your breath away. Because if you imagine for a moment being in this place of exile, and you've been praying to God, crying out to God to do something, 
And I want you to think about your prayers to God when you need God to do something and you cry out to God, God, help me fix this situation. And usually when we pray, when we cry out to God, um, we're looking for a pretty quick return on that prayer, right? Now listen to the timeline here. Because God will promise them uh, that they will return home, but it's not in a couple of weeks or even a couple of years. So listen to this. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I've promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen, and if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. Now, for any of you, does that promise ring kind of hollow? If God God says to you, hey, I'm going to do this thing in 70 years, what's your reaction to that? I'm thinking, I'm probably not going to be here for that, first of all, right? So, Let's think about the context here. Basically what God is saying, he's speaking to them as a community, not as individuals, but as a community and saying, listen, I've not forgotten you. I've not forgotten you as a people. I am with you, right? He gives them the promise that he will be with them. He will hear their prayers. He will be with them. He will restore them. But this promise from God is not just for today or tomorrow. It's for the long haul. And it's a promise that's for their descendants to come after them. I mean, maybe the children who are hearing this will see it come to fruition, but most of the people hearing this promise won't even actually see it during their lifetime. It's hard to receive that as good news, isn't it? I think it's hard to receive it as good news. But it also challenges our perspective on things, doesn't it? I mean, we live in a time and a place where things are, everything's at our fingertips and we're pretty sure that whatever we want or need, we should probably get it right now or if not right now, you know, in the next few hours or days, you know, and, and, and we get tired in a hurry of crying out to God, don't we? And we wonder why God, we think, doesn't hear us and why we think God isn't answering our prayers. And we're reminded that one, God doesn't work on our timeline, but... <laughs> I want you to hear what God says to these people. Get busy living. There's life to be lived. In the moment of exile, in this place of exile, there's life to be lived. Get busy living. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean the pain goes away. I mean, these people were devastated. But they received this word and they had the opportunity to choose life. And not only life for themselves, but to choose life for their community, to be a blessing to the community, to reorient themselves from their suffering to an opportunity to be a blessing for others. Now, in some really incredible ways, I think um, this passage lines up then with our mission as a congregation. I mean, we gather in this place first and foremost to connect with God, to build our relationship with God. But we can't miss that next step, which is to go and love our neighbor, to be a blessing in the world. And in the midst, we come sometimes in our pain and our grief. We come sometimes in our joy and celebration. We come in our everyday lives, and into that, God speaks into our lives and sends us out. Now, friends, uh, as we kind of pull the pieces of this series together and what's happening here today, a few things I want you to think about. Uh, As we said earlier, Christmas is coming. It's not that far away. And Christmas is all about God's promise to come and do something. Right? God's ultimate promise to us is that God has conquered sin and death. That no matter what happens to us in this life, God's got us. No matter what happens to us in this life, Eternal life is a gift that we receive. Jesus is coming into this world to give his life for us. Now, as we've been talking about being in tune with God's heart, I think for me, the, the biggest question always is, well, what does God's heart look like? We got a, a glimpse of that last week, but I want to say the best way to know God's heart is to look at Jesus. 
How did Jesus live? What did Jesus do? And what did we see in Jesus? Time and time again, his heart was always for people. It was always about relationships. And particularly, it was about the people who were on the outside. And it's not lost on me that the people that Jesus was most often irritated with was the religious leaders. It was the church leaders who Jesus said, what the heck are you guys doing? You totally missed the point here. You've forgotten what this is all about. You turned it into a business. And all I want you to do is love people. Is that really that hard? And it turns out it is hard. Because we're people. And we're sinful. And we're broken. And we're selfish. And it is hard. But Jesus came and showed us how to do it. He did. And he was always looking for who was being left out and he went to those people and he loved them and he welcomed them in and he reminded us that God doesn't leave any of us behind. God doesn't leave any of us out. And God calls us as a faith community to not only gather to know that we are loved, but then to be sure that we go from here to let others know that they are loved as well. Right? We're blessed to be a blessing and we're gathered to be sent. We're sent into this world. And so we're reminded that ultimately God orients us in this place towards our community, towards our neighbors. And so many of you I know have experienced that blessing in this place. You've experienced God's love in this place. And as we come to Consecration Sunday, I want to remind you that, first of all, Consecration Sunday is about your own response to what God has done in your life. But it's also a look to the future, the future that God is calling us towards, And it's a reminder that God is calling us to be a blessing, to reach out to those who do not know this love. Some of you have come today uh, with your Consecration Sunday giving intent card. We have these big fancy cards here. They say, living in tune with God's heart for the world. Those of you at home, we also have this online, as we said earlier. You can find it on our link tree or on our website. If you didn't bring it with you today, you can bring it in this week, mail it or fill it out online. It's a piece of paper, but it means a whole lot more. This is an opportunity for us in conversation with God to say yes to what God is doing in this place and in our lives. And it's an opportunity to say thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Now take what you've given me and help me to be a blessing for the world. And that's our hope as a church, as a faith community. That we make a real tangible difference in the lives of the people around us. I think we do that. I think we do that well. So friends, if you haven't had a chance to be in prayer about this yet, I invite you to do so in the week to come. And see where God moves you. Uh, This last year here at New Heights, I think a lot to do with COVID, we're, we're behind on our giving. We're having to make adjustments for the budget for next year, and we're wondering how we can do the things that we're called to do. And it really comes down to your response. How's God moving in you? What's God speaking to you? How's God inviting you to be a part of what God's doing here? God speaks to the people in exile today, and he says, get busy living. And as you're living, be a blessing to your community. Pray for your community. Bless your community. That's what you're called to do and to be. So that's what we do in this place. We love God, we love our neighbor, and we grow disciples. I want to thank you all today for your continued generosity and the ways that we are church together. It's really an incredible thing. Let's pray. Awesome, God. Lord, we imagine those Israelites in exile today, and it's hard to fathom such a complicated, difficult living. And yet, Lord, we know, and you are well acquainted with our own pain and suffering. Lord, you know our grief, you know our hurt, you know our struggles, you know how hard, especially the last few years, have been. We're hurting, Lord. And so, God, we invite you to come into our pain and to speak to us, to be with us, to meet us here. And as you heal us, Lord, help us. Help us to emerge from this pain, Lord, to be a blessing. Help us, Lord, to look for those opportunities to get busy living. 
to build a life, a life not only for ourselves, but a life that is a blessing to the world around us. And God, today we're grateful for this faith community, this community you've made us a part of. We have been blessed in this place. And God, we're excited about the ways that we get to be a blessing for others. So God, continue to lead and guide us to help us to keep our hearts and minds focused on you, that we might be in tune with your heart for the world. Help us to be oriented towards our community to be a blessing. Thank you, God, for never giving up on us, for always being with us and walking with us each day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.